medcram.com. Hey guys, welcome to another MedCram bird flu update. Today we're going to cover the Canadian case and also some of the genetics that have been released from that case, which are concerning in terms of mutations. So what we need to do is understand some of the lingo. So if we look at the influenza virus in general, we need to understand a couple of things. There are receptors on the surface, specifically something called the hemagglutinin, which is the HA, which is this protein right here, and also neuraminidase, which is NA, which is this protein right here. And what we do often is we will categorize this into an H and an N number. And that's what we've done here with this case. We knew pretty early on that it was an H5, and now we've confirmed that it's an H5N1 specific case. And that's important to understand because these are the things that will actually bind to the receptors and allow the virus to infect the human being. Specifically, what we're going to be looking at here is the hemagglutinin, or the HA. And that's important to understand because the HA actually binds something called sialic acids. We've talked about sialic acids before, but we're going to be looking at it a little bit more carefully. These are nine carbon sugars that are on the very tips of the surfaces of cells. And so this is really important if you want to figure out whether or not a virus is going to infect a specific species. So here again, we have the hemagglutinin protein on the surface of the influenza virus. And what we're looking at here is two different sialic acids. There's an alpha-2-6 and then a galactose sugar, and that's typically seen in human beings. That's the 2-6 versus in birds, the 2-3. And again, when we look through the human respiratory system, we see these receptors in the trachea, in the bronchioles, and the alveoli. Looking at this very carefully here, there's two possible bindings here from the hemagglutinin protein on the surface of the influenza virus. It can either bind an alpha-2-6 or an alpha-2-3 linkage to a galactose. I'll show you what that looks like. And again, I just want to document this and show you this is a paper that was published some time ago, back in actually 2007, titled An Avian Influenza H5N1 Virus That Binds to a Human Type Receptor. So let's take a look here at this article. They said, in contrast to most avian influenza viruses, which do not readily infect humans, highly pathogenic avian influenza H5N1 virus strains can transmit directly from avian species to humans and cause severe disease. Despite the ability to infect and cause severe disease in humans, most H5N1 viruses do not bind to sialic acid alpha-2,6-galactose. They do not bind to the alpha-2,6 with high affinity. They go on to say it's believed that this receptor binding property is the major factor preventing H5N1 virus from efficiently transmitting from person to person or human to human and causing a pandemic. The receptor binding preference of H5N1 viruses can be altered by only a few amino acid substitutions in the hemagglutinin protein. Mutations that change the receptor binding preference from the avian to the human type could potentially enable the virus to transmit efficiently in the human population and cause a catastrophic pandemic. Monitoring these viral changes is therefore extremely important in the current situation where H5N1 viruses are spreading progressively. I think that summarizes it quite well. So I want you to understand the chemistry here of what's going on. We've got two figures. We've got figure A, which is the specific situation with the alpha-2,6. This is the human. And we have in B, the 2,3 galactose, which is what we see in the birds. This galactose molecule, which is right here, in both situations, we have carbon number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, six at that corner right there. Here we have one, two, three, four, five, and there actually should be a six up here. Notice here that the linkage is coming off here and it's coming off of a three, and here the linkage is coming off up here from the six. That's the difference. Here it's coming from a three, here it's coming from a 6, and that's the difference between a 2-6 linkage and a 2-3 linkage. Now notice up here, this is a 9-carbon, so here we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and the same thing down here. And so it's coming off of the second carbon here, that's what makes this first number 2, and that's here what makes the first number 2. So again, 
Two six linkage is going to be human. Two three linkage is going to be birds. And that very small change that we see here, even though it's the same sialic acid at the end, that difference in linkage can mean the difference between whether an H5N1 virus infects a bird or a human being. When they've looked at cells that specifically in vitro express a alpha-2-6 sialic acid linkage versus an alpha-2-3 sialic acid linkage, they're able to see in the hemagglutinin protein, this is the protein again back on the virus, if there's mutations somewhere along the protein of hemagglutinin, if there are mutations at specific spots, whether or not it will affect whether or not it infects an alpha-2-6, which is human, or an alpha-2-3, which is bird. This graph is set up to show which mutations specifically tend to make something go from a 2-3 to a 2-6. So let's read it here. The plot shows the difference in entry in cells expressing exclusively a alpha-2-6 versus those expressing an alpha-2-3. Positive values, which we see right here, indicate mutations that improve a 2,6 usage. In other words, infection of cells expressing exclusively a 2,6 sialic acid. So what we're saying here is that mutations specifically at 190 and 226 in the hemagglutin molecule protein in the H5N1 virus will seem to shift over to more of a human infection. Well, just recently, the CDC for British Columbia and the Canadian Public Health Agency released the genetics on this teenager that is now infected and is being hospitalized in the intensive care unit in British Columbia. First of all, let's read what the press release shows, and this was just published recently. They say here that the Public Health Agency of Canada today announced that the National Microbiology Laboratory in Winnipeg has confirmed that the H5 avian flu detected in British Columbia is the H5N1 virus. We knew it was H5. We've just found out it is N1. Yesterday, British Columbia health officials said that the previously healthy teen is hospitalized in critical condition. Today's confirmation marks Canada's first locally acquired H5N1 infection. Genetic sequencing suggests that the H5N1 virus is closely related to those circulating in BC poultry, meaning that it belongs to the 2.3.4.4B clade and to the D.1.1 genotype. Make note of that because this is the clade and this is the genotype that we're seeing in Western Canada and also a handful of Western states in the poultry outbreaks. This is not the genotype, by the way, that's seen in U.S. dairy cattle. That is the B3.13 genotype. So far, they're saying no other human infections have been detected in Canada and investigations are still underway to determine how the team was exposed to the virus. What they didn't go through in this article is actually look at the mutations specifically seen in this virus. On X, James Wheeland, who is a PhD at the University of Michigan, posted this. He said, okay, this is actually concerning. The sequence of the hospitalized teen with H5N1 has been released. Both of these mutation sites are known to impact alpha-2,6 binding that is needed for human-to-human -human transmissibility. Need top experts on H5N1 to immediately look into this. This is a repost of a Bloom Laboratory post that said, to add to the thread linked above, human British Columbia H5 case has a hemagglutinin, as we talked about, sequence that is ambiguous at both site Q226 and site 190. When we say ambiguous, it means that there's a number of different values that they're coming up with looking as though there may be mutation in those areas. 226 and 190 were the two areas that conveyed specific ability to infect alpha-2,6 linkages, which is seen in human tissue. So this is James Whelan again. He's saying here that the right mutations at these sites can on paper significantly increase human-to-human -human transmission. That's why there needs to be an immediate focus on this sample. It's somewhat unclear if the mutations occurred in this patient or prior to their infection. He goes on to say, it is also concerning that this is the first severe case that we've had in North America out of many now. That is true. Is it a coincidence that these potentially human-to-human -human supporting mutations are linked to the most severe outcome? 
And then he posts this down here. This is a graph looking at what types of mutations in the protein moves away from infecting two, three linkages and increases the possibility of alpha two, six linkages. He says, I'd like to see some more clarification of the exact mutations at position 190 and 226 and what the predicted shift is for each. It's also been suggested that there may be both the original amino acids and the mutations in the same sample. This might suggest that they evolved in this patient. He's absolutely correct. We can see the different sites on that HA protein. He's circled them for us here. He circled the 190, and what that typically does is it moves it away from 2,3 in the birds and makes it a lot more likely in the 2,6, which is the humans. Not only the 190 there, the 190 here, also the 226 here, and the 226 there. Do we have enough information at this hour to say that the case in British Columbia could cause the beginning of a pandemic and human-to-human -human transmission? It's difficult to say. We don't know exactly what mutation is at this point, at least I don't. I think what we need to do is have the experts look at this particularly and come up with an idea about what exactly is going on. One thing is for sure, in the upcoming days, weeks, there's going to be more discussion about these mutations. There's going to be more discussion about HA and what this means in terms of a pandemic. And I think if we want to be good consumers of information, we're going to need to know exactly what these things mean. And that's why we're here. If you like this, please subscribe, turn on notifications, leave us a comment. And also join us at medcram.com where we love to explain these things clearly so that people can understand. Thanks for joining us.